As we continue in our sermon series, Resurrection Power, our New Testament reading comes from the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 24, verses 36 through 43. Listen for God's word for us this morning. While they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, why are you frightened? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet, see that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy, they were still disbelieving and still wondering. He said to them, have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy God, still our hearts, still our minds, that we may dwell here in your presence and stir among us your spirit that we would follow where you lead. In your son's name we pray, amen. Think back a year with me, will you? Back to when we were in stay-at-home orders and we were still getting this quarantine and isolation thing under our belt. Okay, are you there? Now, do you remember the first time you met with somebody on Zoom or a video call? How much fun was that? How much joy did that bring your day, right? Just to see the image of someone you loved was pretty great. Now, a year later, be honest, show of hands, how many are experiencing some Zoom fatigue? I know this guy is right here. (laughs) But you know what I haven't grown tired of? What I desire even now more than I did a year ago? I long to hug my parents and siblings to hold my two nephews that were born in this past year. No matter how many pictures or video calls I get, the desire for the physical touch has not left me. How about you? Now don't get me wrong, I take a video call or picture over nothing, but in some way the image and the screen just present a metaphor, an image standing in for the real thing. In our passage for today, I think the disciples are experiencing something similar. Now, just a reminder of where we are in our text, even though here today we stand two weeks after Easter, in our text we are still on that Easter day. The women have gone to the tomb in the morning and ran back and told the disciples what they saw. Cleopas and his companion encountered Jesus on the road to Emmaus and ran back and told the disciples what they saw. And then we get to our passage, toward the end of the day on that first Easter, when the disciples were recapping all the crazy events that unfolded. And then Jesus appears before them. At first, the disciples thought Jesus was a ghost, an image, or a mirage of sorts. They were excited and confused and wondering what was going on. But Jesus, being Jesus, knows what the disciples are thinking and says, I'm not a ghost. I'm not an image. It is me. Really, truly, physically me. For six verses, Jesus repeatedly tries to show them that he is physically there saying, why do you doubt? Here are my hands and my feet. Touch me, my skin, my bones. See me. Don't believe me yet? Fine, give me something to eat. How about now? Now, if you think you have a lot of questions running through your head right now, imagine the disciples. I'm sure they were thinking, how did this happen? How does this work? Is your body like ours, or is it similar but transformed in a way. Again, how did this happen? Is this going to happen to me? 
Um, Jesus, I don't think you answered me yet. How did this happen? Like so much of the Bible, we don't get to see the how necessarily. We don't get a clear understanding of the process or the means by which things happened. But we start to get to a why. Why would God bring Jesus back in bodily, physical form instead of just a spirit or an image? Why would Jesus want his disciples to touch, to feel, and embrace him? Perhaps the why has something to do with God's desire for our joy. The verse that sums up this whole exchange for me is verse 41. While in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering. I love the tension that the disciples experienced to be joyful and yet disbelieving and still wondering. Can you live in that tension? Can you find joy in what you don't fully understand? Now, in many ways, the first century Jews aren't much different than we are as North American Christians today. I imagine if we interviewed Christians all over the country, some wouldn't believe in any kind of afterlife. For some, it would be a disembodied spiritual state, and others would believe in a physical, bodily resurrection. Probably a lot of our beliefs would be based around reason. Reason and belief and disbelief, wondering, now how would that happen? I can't understand this or that. And so often I feel like we get tripped up in the how that we turn Jesus' resurrection into a metaphor for an inspirational life that we can understand. And in the process, however, We miss out on the joy of the why of the resurrection. The disciples sat in that tension between disbelieving and joy. Joy not because they cracked the code of how Jesus pulled off this magic trick, but joy because they were starting to understand the why of it. When I see the disciples' joy and our record of their actions after the resurrection, the boldness in which they lived and proclaimed Jesus' resurrection, the decisions they made in their life. I can't help but believe they started to grasp, literally grasp what Jesus' bodily resurrection meant for them and the world. Perhaps the disciples even remember the day that Jesus stood up in the temple and read from the scroll of Isaiah, saying, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. I wonder if these words came back to the disciples and they realized Jesus' work isn't done here yet. Here on earth. Here where he promised that the mourning would be comforted and that the oppressed would hear good news. And that if Jesus came back from the dead and defeated death, perhaps, just perhaps, he would redeem all that has been broken all of it. Redeem all that has suffered loss, all of it. Raise and redeem our loved ones from the dead, all of them. Redeem and transform the world as we know it, just as he himself has been transformed and made new. This sounds unbelievable, but doesn't it sound joyful? Can you live in this tension? I wonder about us and our lives. What is unbelievable that we might just find joyful? And at the same time, I wonder what is absolutely believable, predictable, unsurprising even, but fully lacks any joy? What is believable but lacks joy? I wonder.
It is absolutely believable, isn't it, to share motivational messages like, it gets better, hang in there, or love wins. And at the same time, to see the cycle of brokenness and violence continue in our world. I don't wish this by any means, but it is absolutely believable, right? We can hold on to a metaphorical resurrection and say, love wins. But it is absolutely believable when we hear of the news of Dante Wright being shot and killed at a traffic stop. We can say, hang in there with the inspiration of a metaphorical resurrection. But it is absolutely believable when we hear of the shorting of housing in Charlotte while seeing the rise of homelessness. We can preach the metaphorical resurrection and say it gets better, but it is absolutely believable when we hear of children and the rise of mental health issues through all of the pressures and extra stressors in life. These are absolutely believable. If we've seen it once, we won't be surprised to see it again and again. And yet I find no joy in saying any of this which we find believable. And yet, wouldn't it be unbelievable if in Jesus' resurrection he was showing us the first fruit of a new creation, a glimpse of a time when God's dwelling place would be with humanity, where the dead would be raised, where your family would embrace lost loved ones, where Dante Wright and the countless others would live again redeemed without fear, where conflict would be resolved, where perpetrator and victim would find peace, where tears would be wiped away from our eyes, where there would be war no more, where people would know no hunger, or hate, where all who are homeless now would have a place to lay their head, not in a disembodied state, not just as a metaphor to motivate us into better lives now, but truly, physically, to touch, to hold, to live, to feel this reality. Now that sounds unbelievable, right? I've got a lot of questions of how that would happen. But when I start to think about the resurrection in that way, I begin to understand with all the disciples why God is up to this. I find joy in why God is interested in the bodily resurrection. For when I think about a redeemed and transformed creation where God and Jesus dwells with humanity, it sounds like what God has been up to all along. Starting in Genesis, when God desired to be with humanity. It sounds like Jesus' birth, when God put on flesh and body and chose to live among us in creation. It sounds like Revelation, a vision of the future, when at the coming of the kingdom, God makes a dwelling place here on earth where there is nothing in our world, our relationships, in our living that separates us from God. Surely that sounds unbelievable and unexplainable, but I hope it brings you joy, for it sure brings me joy and hope as this is the good news of the gospel. What does this bodily resurrection sound like to you? Does it sound unbelievable? Does it sound like an idle tale? Or does it sound like resurrection power? Can you dare to live into this tension of unbelief and joy? As we will see in the weeks to come, Jesus' resurrection isn't just joy in waiting, but it's joy with an invitation now an invitation to touch the future reality of a, de- of a redeemed world, an invitation to touch again that which was thought to be lost forever, an invitation not just to give platitudes of it gets better 
where love wins, but to start living radically into the hope of the coming kingdom now, to start standing up to the all too believable cycles of pain and brokenness, trusting not in our own efforts, but striving our best, trusting in God's faithfulness through Christ's resurrection. Unbelievable? Perhaps. But what if we follow our joy into that promised resurrection world? The believing can catch up whenever it wants to. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen.